It's the dawn of the 1970s. America is in the grip of social and political unrest. The Vietnam War is dividing the nation. The civil rights movement is fighting for equality. And in the world of psychology, old assumptions are being challenged. One man stands at the center of this psychological revolution. His name is Philip Zimbardo, a charismatic young professor at Stanford University. Today, we're going back in time to those tumultuous days to explore the notorious Stanford prison experiment. We'll walk through the mock prison, meet the guards and prisoners, and try to understand how a simple role play turned into a psychological nightmare. The stage was set in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building, which was transformed into a shockingly realistic prison environment. Here, Zimbardo and his team would play out their scenario, pushing the boundaries of ethical research in their pursuit of knowledge. Yeah. This is where it all happened in the summer of 1971. Right down this corridor in the basement of the psychology department is where we converted these offices and storage rooms to prison cells. And we had students like yourself, college students from all over the country, play the roles of either prisoners or guards. This was the yard, the prison yard. Uh, here in this closet was solitary confinement, the infamous hole where the guards put uh, prisoners for punishment. Advertisements were put out, recruiting male college students for a psychological study of prison life. Out of the 75 who responded, 24 were selected. They were the most psychologically stable and healthy, the cream of the crop, so to speak. With the stage set and the actors in place, the experiment was ready to begin. The students were randomly divided into two groups, guards and prisoners. It was expected to be a simple two-week study of prison behavior, but no one was prepared for what would follow. Police car pulls up in front and a cop comes to the front door, knocks, and says he's looking for me. So they, right there, they, you know, they took me out the door, they put my hands against the um, car. It was a real cop car, it was a real policeman, and there were real neighbors in the street who didn't know that I was, uh, this was an experiment. The experiment began with a bang, quite literally. Each prisoner was arrested at their homes, charged with armed robbery, handcuffed, and brought to the makeshift prison. It was a staged act, but the line between fiction and reality was beginning to blur. At the prison, they were stripped, deloused, and issued a prison uniform, a smock with a number instead of their name. They were assigned small cramp cells. The guards, on the other hand, were given uniforms, batons, and mirrored sunglasses to avoid any eye contact. The guards were given full authority over the prisoners, short of physical violence. Their job was to maintain law and order in the prison, but the power dynamics were about to take a dark turn. Everybody out! Oh, oh, come on. Oh, oh. Well, oh. gentlemen, here it is, time for camp. At 2.30 a.m., the prisoners were rudely awakened from their sleep by the night guard shift for their count. The guards were told to routinely perform counts to familiarize the prisoners with their numbers, and determined that they were all present and accounted for. But more important, it provided a regular occasion for the guards to interact with and exercise control over the prisoners. There were several counts every day and night. Within the first day, the guards had already started to exhibit authoritarian tendencies. They set strict rules and punished any sign of defiance. The prisoners, on the other hand, began to internalize their roles. The first night passed without incident. However, on the second day, the prisoners staged a rebellion. They barricaded their cells and refused to follow the guards' orders. This act of rebellion marked the beginning of an escalating cycle of abuse and dehumanization that would shock the world. The guards responded to the rebellion with an iron fist. They used fire extinguishers to force the prisoners out of their cells, stripped them, and removed their beds. Sanitary conditions rapidly deteriorated. Prisoners were punished with push-ups or sent to the hole, a small dark closet. As the days passed, the situation inside the mock prison worsened. The guards became increasingly sadistic, inventing new forms of psychological torture. They deprived the prisoners of sleep, humiliated them, and imposed random rules just to demonstrate their power. The prisoners, in turn, became more submissive. Some even appeared to forget that they were part of an experiment, referring to themselves by their assigned numbers rather than their names. They sought the guards' approval 
and turned on their fellow prisoners who tried to resist. But this was more than just roleplay. Real emotions were at stake. Some prisoners showed signs of extreme stress and psychological trauma. One prisoner had to be released after 36 hours due to uncontrollable bursts of screaming, crying, and anger. Yet, the experiment continued. Every aspect of the prison environment was designed to depersonalize the prisoners, to make them feel less human. The brutality was no longer just a simulation, it was real. At the helm of this unfolding catastrophe was Philip Zimbardo himself. Immersed in his role as the prison superintendent, he oversaw the experiment from his control room. Unsettlingly, Zimbardo admitted later that he too was swept up in the situation, prioritizing the prison over the well-being of the participants. Zimbardo, watching as the guards and prisoners plunged deeper into their roles, did not halt the experiment. As he later stated, he didn't just see the suffering, he saw the data. The experiment was scheduled to last two weeks, but it was spiraling out of control. As the days went by, the conditions deteriorated further. The guards continued to torment the prisoners, devising even more humiliating punishments. They took away basic necessities, such as bedding and toilet privileges. The prisoners were broken down, both physically and mentally. Meanwhile, the world outside was oblivious to the terrifying scenario unfolding in the basement of Stanford's psychology department. That was about to change. Enter Christina Maslach, a former graduate student of Zimbardo and his soon-to-be wife. Invited to observe the experiment, she was horrified by what she witnessed. The sight of young men reduced to such dehumanized states was too much to bear. Maslach confronted Zimbardo about the inhumane conditions and expressed her concerns about the participants' well-being. It was a wake-up call. Zimbardo, who had been caught up in the experiment himself, was brought back to reality. It was then, after just six days, that the Stanford prison experiment was terminated. The artificial prison was disbanded, the uniforms returned, and the basement of Stanford University was once again just a basement. When the doors of the mock prison were finally opened, it was as if everyone involved was waking up from a nightmare. The participants, guards, and prisoners alike stepped back into reality, but the experiment had left an indelible mark. In the immediate aftermath, the participants were debriefed and counseled. It was a time of reflection, confusion, and shock as they attempted to reconcile their actions and experiences with their pre-experiment identities. Many of the guards expressed surprise and guilt over their actions. They'd been transformed by a sense of power and authority, revealing a capacity for cruelty they hadn't known existed within them. The prisoners, on the other hand, grappled with feelings of humiliation, powerlessness, and anger. For them, the experience was a deeply disturbing glimpse into the reality of imprisonment and the psychological impact of dehumanization. But the aftermath extended far beyond the individuals directly involved. The revelations from the Stanford Prison Experiment sent shockwaves through the academic community and the public alike. In the years that followed, the experiment was heavily scrutinized and criticized. Ethical concerns were raised about Zimbardo's role as both the lead researcher and the superintendent of the prison. The validity of the results was questioned, as were the potential long-term effects on the participants. Zimbardo himself faced significant backlash, but he continued to defend the experiment's importance. He argued that it provided invaluable insights into human nature and the corrupting influence of power. In spite of its controversy, the Stanford Prison Experiment has left an indelible mark on the field of psychology. It served as a haunting reminder of the thin line between roleplay and reality, between civilized behavior and savagery, when put in certain situational and systemic pressures. Today, the basement that once housed the infamous Stanford Prison is back to its normal state, but the memories and lessons of that experiment still echo through its halls. It stands as a testament to a dark chapter in the annals of psychological research, a cautionary tale about the dangers of unfettered authority and dehumanization. I was told that I couldn't quit. And at that point, I felt that, well, it was really a prison. And at that point, um, I don't know, I just, there's no way I can describe how I felt. I just felt totally hopeless more hopeless than I'd ever felt before.